Good evening. I'm Rafael Martinez in Swan in Darkness. Valentine's Day is coming up. And quite frankly, people have questions about love. And being someone who's had a marginally successful run at it, right now I'm going through a good championship run. Six years going strong. So I think I know a thing or two about love. I wouldn't call myself a doctor at it, but I'm definitely a nurse. And being a male nurse isn't bad, even though people try to shame you for it all the time. Being a male nurse of love is pretty legit. You don't have to do any of the the tough medical stuff. You just got to do all the easy medical stuff. And I'm good at that. So let's find out. What do you want to know? And how can I help you? First question's a bit of a doozy here. I want to make sure. I read this right because it's not going to be good, it seems. Hey, Ralph. That's me. Me and my boyfriend have been together for three years. He's obsessed with NFTs and the blockchain technology. It's all he talks about. He wanted me to get pregnant so I could turn my ultrasound into an NFT. He created a cryptocurrency for chores around the house. It's called Domesticoin. Because he refused to go back to work during the pandemic, he's able to amass huge number of domestic coins. Ralph, how do I cash out on this speculative investment in him? Kate. I'm going to be honest, Kate. It sounds like you're the speculative investment. Because that man knows the future. NFTs, blockchain, future. That's how it goes. I don't make the rules about the blockchain and the future. But as far as I know, from what I heard from a bunch of people I met on Clubhouse... NFTs is a new way of collecting art, all right? You can own it. Yeah, you know, some people will, from time to time, screenshot it and share it on their Instagrams. And, you know, share it. So it kind of doesn't matter if you own it. I mean, I mean, maybe it does matter. I mean, could, could I legally tell someone, hey, I own that. You can't put that on Instagram. But how many times a day will you have to do that? That's infinite lawsuits that no one's got the money for. But you technically own the NFT. No one can copy it. But it's on the blockchain. And I've been told the blockchain is the future. For money, art, and society. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're the problem here. NFTs are a little weird, though. People typically say that people will just own anything, and that's their justification for NFTs, but that's not really a argument for NFTs. It's kind of an argument against NFTs, if you think about it. But where he is ahead of the game, Kate, and I hate to break it to you, is Domesticoin. That's genius. Um, Think about it, you know. Washing dishes get you a foot massage. You cash in a few domestic coins. You know, you can cash in domestic coins on other things like, oh, I don't want to go to your mom's house. I'm going to hang out at my house, so that's cool. You can ditch family events going, oh, I got five domestic coins. I say, I'm not doing that. You know, he probably does use it, you know, nicely. He'll probably be like, here's a domestic coin. Shut the fuck up. You know, that's what I would do if I had domestic coin. But that was if I was him, not necessarily if I was me. I would never... Tell my girlfriend shut the fuck up because she'd kick my ass. But in his situation, he's got domestic coins. And he's he is the bank. He is the Federal Reserve. He is the blockchain. So yeah, I don't know what to tell you, Kate. That's a tough spot here. I mean, do you even have enough domestic coins to dump him? I don't think you do. And, you know, I mean, he's he's an entrepreneur. You know, he's not going back to work. He's hanging out, you know, on the Internet, on the blockchain, making deals. Hey, he's gathering assets. If anything, you should quit your job and gather some assets, too, because in a future where everyone will own, own nothing and be happy, you'll be the only ones owning something, or at least part of the select few that own something. It might be a bored ape, but you'll own something. You'll have something in your hand, technically, if you print it out. That's kind of the problem with digital assets. You don't really hold them, do you? 
I guess you could put them in a digital frame and have it play over and over. But that's battery powered, so we run out of battery. No one can see it. So then it's kind of worthless in an apocalyptic future. There's no energy. I still stand by this dude, though. I think he's thinking forward. I mean, you know, women always say men don't think ahead. But we, he's thinking ahead. Maybe, you know, Kate, you're living in 2022 and he's living in 2042. Maybe of an alternate timeline. I don't know what to tell you, Kate. I don't tell you. I, I think you might have to stick this one out. I mean, it's, it's NFTs. You know, even Lindsay Lohan has an NFT. AMC is giving out NFTs. It's very confusing. I feel like you, I feel like an NFT loses its value if a bunch of people have it. I don't know. Maybe I can get an NFT, but I don't know what my NFT would be. I couldn't sell episodes of this podcast. That can't be an NFT. So what? You own an episode of the podcast. People are still going to be able to hear it and listen to it hear it and listen to it. Good job. Be able to watch it on the YouTube tubes. Mm. But I gotta hand it to them. Domestic coin does sound good. And I think domestic coin would actually keep people together. Okay. At least you're, ex- it's open exchange. Like instead of going, you know, my wife never, you know, gives me a blow job. You know what I mean? She's got, you got domestic coin, you know, in theory, yes, that's prostitution. Cause you're giving away currency. For a blow job, so you are technically turning your spouse into a prostitute. But if it's an agreement within a shared house of the currency known as domestic coin, and the agreement has happened with the almighty blockchain, then I don't think it is prostitution. I think it's a fair exchange between two people in a, you know, free environment. It's all about freedom. That's what I've been told. So, Kate, I think you might have to get some more domestic coin. What's the, and I would like to know what the conversion rate for domestic coin is because I currently have a bunch of Dogecoin. I want to see if I can cash in on this next up and coming currency. Thank you, Kate. And good luck, buddy. Good luck. Oh, man. These get worse and worse. Hey, Ralph. That's me. I recently joined a cult. Nice. And things have gotten messy. Well, I would argue things got messy when you joined a cult. I was inspired by your show and how everything is a cult. So what's the difference between the Branch Davidians and the U.S. government? A few things. Anyways, I've been spending time with our leader and his family. He made me sleep with his wife so I can purify my energy in her purification chamber. Me and her have become close and want to get away. What should we do? Balthazar. Well, I mean... One, I would like to know what cult this is, so I can do an episode on them. Two, um, you purified your energy in her purification chamber, so I assume that means sexual intercourse, which doing that with another man's wife, I don't condone. But if he condoned it, then I guess that's a form of cult cucking. And if cult cucking is, in fact, a thing, if they're happy with it, I don't mind it. But I still find it a bit weird where you want your wife to get banged by some other dude in front of you. And I just don't understand that concept. Nor do I understand the concept of having a cult where, you know, your wife can bang people, but, you know, you're banging everybody too. It's like, no, if you're going to be a cult leader, you want to hold her back and go, you can't do that. I can do that. That's the whole point of a man having a cult, really. It's having the harem. I've never seen a cult start with pure intentions. I've never seen a cult start with, oh, yeah, I'm going to make a few dollars and leave. It always ends up in a harem. So... I guess he's trying to get ahead of it. I guess like, yo, if I let her cheat, then she'll let me have a bunch of um, concubines as well. But I don't know. I think, you know, now you mentioned it, you fell in love with her and she fell in love with you. So now he's kind of fucked because he's losing a guy who's been rising up the ranks. Clearly, you've been hanging out with the family and now he's going to lose a top deacon to his queen or his cult queen or whatever. And they're going to run off. And who knows what you'll say about the cult then? I mean, It'll be a good 2020 special. Maybe Netflix will cover it. That'd be kind of cool. I think I can get a good four episodes out of it. Anything more than that, you're just dragging it like most Netflix series do. 
I think what happens a lot is they just go, oh, well, this crime is really interesting. If we can just suck them in with the good stuff earlier and then get into the minutia of who everyone else was involved in the crime and the world around the crime, maybe people will be interested. But it does get kind of boring by episode five of a 10 part series. So why don't we just cut the bullshit and get to the good shit? So Balthazar, you're asking me what you should do. So number one, get a burner phone. All right. Cause you're going to be on the run now. Um, cause Oh man, he's going to find you. Uh, they cult leaders always, you know, want back what belongs to them and you both belong to him. Um, and to be honest, let's keep it a buck. Did you really purify your energy in her purification chamber if you're stealing his wife? Because that doesn't sound pure to me. So that sounds a bit sus to me. Your name is Balthazar, too. I wonder if that's a cult name. You know what I mean? Like, if that was his name before the cult, I like to imagine his name is Jerry. And then he became Balthazar. I hope it's a space-like cult. Could that be kind of fire? Space-like cults are always cool because, like, there's a, it has the good long game. You're waiting for a spaceship to appear, but what if it never appears? Well, yeah, maybe next year. It's a good, it's a good scheme. I like the scheme. Sorry, I forgot to move my stuff closer to me. I'm doing that while recording the show. You see that? You guys get behind the scenes access all the time. But yeah, I mean, purification chamber, that probably definitely means like at least a Dragon Ball Z cult. You know what I mean? I mean, they had chambers in there. They had had hyperbolic time chambers. You know what I mean? They had, well, I guess the healing chamber they used for Plant Namek when Goku needed it before he fought Frieza. So there's that. Um, Yeah, I wonder. Like, See, that's the thing, Balthazar. I need to know more about this cult because... Are you playing by the rules technically? Like, are you allowed to take his wife? I don't know. I don't know. And to answer your question, the Branch Davidians and the government, there's a lot different with that. The Branch Davidians were crazy. And he too was, wow, he too was banging everyone's wife. And those dudes couldn't bang their wife anymore, which I find to be very confusing. And that's the interesting about this guy. So about this, you can't really get mad at your leader because... He's letting you bang his wife. In other cults, guys don't get to bang girls. Only their girls get banged out, and they sadly have to watch from a corner. So I don't know. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Definitely get the burner phone. Definitely get the burner phone. You're going to want to buy a car, too. Buy it secondhand. You don't want anything that can be traced. Buy it from a guy like on Craigslist or something. If you read it. You know, have the license plate still under his name. So if they ever run it, it comes up to him, not to you. Because remember, you're on the run. And to be honest with you, I don't know how long this relationship's going to last. Because I feel like a lot of this is built on the excitement of she's the wife. And she's, you know, banging this new high-ranking figure. But if he let you, then maybe this is what he wanted. Maybe it's a sick game of cult cut chess. I don't know, man. I don't know. But I guess, I mean, if you guys have a good foundation of what your relationship is and your foundation is being on the run, you're going to have to travel several different places. I mean, I would first start with Mexico because it's always hard to find people in Mexico. I mean, movies prove this all the time. Someone goes to Mexico to hide and it's like they're invisible now. No one finds them, which is weird considering that we now have like satellites and drones and stuff. I figured it'd be a bit easier to find people but apparently not if you go to Mexico and I figure if you start in Mexico you can go down the rest of South America which could be a delightful trip for you guys you've both been through something tough you know you were part of a cult and you know her husband will have murderous rage for you so it will be good to just traverse and Get away a little bit. Visit Panama. Visit Ecuador. You know, Costa Rica is nice this time of year, I hear. But you got to go for it. You know, you made this commitment. You know, you purified your energy in her purification chamber. And I think that carries a lot of weight. I'm not a member of this cult by any means, but it does mean a lot to me that you did that. So I'm going to defend you a little bit here and go, hey, it's all good, buddy. 
It's all good. I just wish I knew what her name was because if I knew what her name was and I can figure out is Balthazar a fake name or is his name they all get, but she didn't, didn't put that in there. Mm -hmm. If I joined a cult, would I even, see, I couldn't do this. I couldn't pull this off. I'm not that attractive. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm witty, but I don't know if a, a cult leader's wife would bang me. I don't know if that's really her thing. You know, maybe the daughter, you know, I can definitely pull the daughters, you know what I mean? Of course, of age. I know you sick fucks out there thinking something else. I hate the internet. But no, like if he's got like a cute 20 something daughter, I can probably pull that off if I was in a cult. You know what I mean? I still have youthful, youthful energy. Who go, oh, he's new. You know, he's adding new layers to the cult. You know what I mean? He seems really nice, dad. And it's like, yeah, I'm really fucking nice. I'm nice, all right. I'm banging your fucking daughter, bro. He would definitely kick me out the cult, which would be unfortunate. Because I always felt if I was going to join a cult, I'd be really dedicated to it. Because I treat it like it's a job, right? Like, to me, if you're going to join a cult, you want to be the best at it, right? And it's why I never understood friends of mine who did join cults or did join weird groups. They didn't try to excel at it. Like, become the next leader, or at least second in command. Why not go for it? You know, you're already there. You didn't do anything else with your real life. You might as well just give it a shot. Become a cult member. High ranking, baby. You probably get a cool robe. You probably get cool benefits. You probably get, you know, your pick of the litter of women. Because that's how it always starts. I've never seen a cult with a woman that was just banging dudes. Never seen that cult. Because I think in order to do that cult, that woman has to be smoke show. Like, we're talking, like, smoke show of all smoke shows. Ain't no ugly chick pulling that. But for somehow ugly, charismatic dudes, they can pull off a cult harem every time. But, yeah, I would like to see reverse on that. Maybe get a female leader who's out there, you know, to be gender progressive. And she's out there, and she's really good looking, and she's got all these dudes, you know what I mean? Just doing her bidding and shit. Sending off, you know, all her lessons and teachings and all that. I think that'd be pretty fire. Yeah, I'd be into that. It'd be a great Netflix series. Could we do that? To change, change it up, don't we? Do that, change it up. Or maybe that's what you should do, Balthazar. Maybe you and your wife can do that now. Maybe because listen, if you're running away with her, she's gotta be a smoke show. All right, like I don't know if a dude who's like stealing somebody's wife and she's not a smoke show. Just saying, like ugly wives don't get taken. They probably get banged by dudes, but you don't get taken. Now, you're trying to run away with her, so she must be something special. Maybe you guys can start, like, an off-branch of the original cult where she's the leader. And then over time, you come into contact with the other cult, cult war. A, a cult civil war. Yes, between the same cult. I can get into this. I can really deal. Oh, man. Mm. Balthazar, I will gladly have you on the show if you want to come on. Gladly, because I, I get there's just so many possibilities, so many possibilities. And you know what? I would say if you could recruit Kate because her man is involved in NFTs in the blockchain. And I think cults in the blockchain are one and the same. Everyone's pretty cult like about it. You ever question the blockchain or any kind of cryptocurrency? People flip their shit at you and call you an idiot and go, you don't see the future, man. You're not living with the vision. And I've always Heard that from drug addicts or cult members. So, you know, maybe pick up Kate. You know, Kate, if you're watching this, you might have a solution here. You know what I mean? Or Balthazar, if you're listening, Domesticoin. Add that to the new cult you're starting. And now we're talking, baby. See, I bring people together. The more I think about Domesticoin, the more it's awesome. I think every couple should have a cryptocurrency and you exchange favors in that way. I dig it. I do, in fact, dig it. Anyway, um, what else can I suggest about this? You already got the getaway car. You already got the burner. I'm already telling you to go to South America. I mean, it worked for the Nazis, so it'll definitely work for you. Hmm. Always be on the move. Always be on the move. That's what I learned from the fugitive. You always got to be on the move. Harrison Ford was always on the move. And Tommy Lee Jones had a real hard time. So, And Tommy Lee Jones, to me, it looks like somebody who could hunt somebody. He's kind of the man I imagine who's the head of this cult, actually. 
And I think Balthazar is kind of like this Joseph Gordon Levitt looking dude. Now, the wife, Tony Collette. That's what I'm thinking. I think that's what it is. Maybe it's because I saw her recently in Nightmare Alley, but I think that's what it is. Is Tony Collette a smoke show? Maybe. I don't know. I never really thought of her that way. I did think of her that way in Nightmare Alley. Went, wow, this is the prettiest I've ever seen her. And it's not because she's not a pretty person. I just think film, well, the role she's taken has always made her be really yelly and weird. So I haven't had a chance to see her be seductive. But seeing her seductive in Nightmare Alley, I went, okay, there's something there. I get what people are saying. I'm with it. Maybe that's the situation you're in. You got yourself a Tony Collette and you're a Joseph Gordon Levitt driving down the highway in Paraguay. Yeah. Good luck, Balthazar. Good luck, former cult wife. And good luck, Kate. Because uh, look, okay, I'm trying to help you out here. I'm giving you I'm giving you options here. Okay? I couldn't get you to like, couldn't help you break up with this dude, but Come on, I'm trying to improve your situation as well. Ridiculous. Hey, Ralphie. Hey, I, li- I like that. Hey, Ralphie. Hey, I like that. It's, that's a little Valentine's gift for me. What do you think is the foundation to a good relationship? Oh, that's a good question. Um, To be honest, I think when people say things like uh, respect and trust, I feel like that should just be given. I feel like that shouldn't be. Something that's negotiated or something that has to be pointed out. That should be in the fine print of the contract you're signing. You know, if I'm going to be with this person, I'm going to respect them. I'm going to be loyal to them. And I'm going to, you know, take care of them. So for me, I think a good foundation should come from the things you share in common, such as morals. You know, morality could be a good foundation. I find that people who at least agree on the very morals of how they live their life, don't have to agree on other things such as favorite music or movies, stuff like that. The morality keeps them together and they're able to appreciate the differences. That's what I've experienced with people or have seen before. For me personally, I always consider humor my foundation for any relationship. It's probably the foundation for the one I have currently. Um, Humor is just something I think anyone can do like there's certain things that my girlfriend does that I find to be hilarious but the thing is no one else would because it's just you have to be in the moment you have to know her you know but she always makes me laugh you know laughter is so important you know last week actually two weeks ago we were talking about how you know laughter and comedy is a love language and it is it's probably one of the most important love languages we have We often don't laugh with each other enough because we're too busy stressing about the bills or stressing about other events we have to attend, things or benchmarks we're trying to meet. But if you're not laughing in between those, I don't know what to tell you because laughing takes a lot of the stress out and you need to laugh. Like, um, they do say, though, that, you know, stress from things you enjoy is kind of equal to regular stress you have. But I don't find that to be true. I maybe for the physical, yeah. Physical, physiology, physiology wise. Yeah. But I often find that when I'm laughing, just, it, everything just melts away, you know? And I think for, um, at least in my situation, we've both been through a lot. So laughing is how we kind of get through it. You know, it's how I got through my entire life. I don't know if I'd be here without laughing or making jokes or being ridiculous, you know, right at this moment, I'm doing it to kind of like melt stress away from, other parts of my life, you know, it's, you, you have to, if you can't laugh with your partner, I don't know, man, like, I, I think my girlfriend's so funny, I once laughed so hard I passed out at something she did, legitimately, like, I was, we were in bed, not doing anything, you know, chit-chatting, and she did, like, this weird voice, and I started laughing to the point where I couldn't breathe, but knowing that I might, you know, fall off the bed, I gently somehow got myself onto the floor and properly passed out. Some would say that's concern, but I actually read on Google that's actually quite common. And I've never been known to breathe when I laugh. I've never been able to, like, you know, stop. I'm like the hyenas in fucking um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know. Like, I will I technically could die laughing. But, you know, I try to be careful with that now, you know, in between laughs. Get a little... My girlfriend has to remind me sometimes to breathe because, you know, she's really funny. And it's really difficult to, like, not laugh, you know. But that's the thing about it. 
Like, one of the things I think I've been uh, learning myself recently is that I need to laugh more. Um, I don't laugh enough. I think I take in a lot of stress. I take in a lot of, you know, anger, and I don't know what to do with it. I, I just... I just let it happen to me. And, you know, I keep forgetting that I've built a foundation on laughter. And when I do remember it, it kind of sobers me up a little bit. And I think even with, you know, in my relationship with our arguments, you know, our foundation is laughter. Like soon after or at least a day after we can go to laughing about it, you know, and pointing out you know the funnier things in the argument. Like you really went there. Like, that was really, you know, your maneuver. That was your strategy. And it's kind of funny, you know. And you have to realize that the person you're with is going through just as much as you are. And they're looking for a release as well. Whether it's, you know, through, you know, hugging, being, you know, affectionate, you know. But laughter, I think, is something you can do anywhere. It's such a cheap trick. You know, like you can both be outside, you know, so you can't ravage each other there and really stress that way unless you're into that kind of thing, which I've never been an exhibitionist. I don't have the confidence for that, nor have I ever had the body for that. I was skinny up until 26. Then I got fat. Now I'm 34. So here we are 10 years, almost, almost 10 years fat. Nice. But, you know, like laughing just... Laughing just works, man. Like right now, I am fucking laughing how stupid I am, but it it does work. And, you know, you should really take that into account, lovers out there. You know, really find what makes your partner so funny to you and try to put them in that situation as much as you can when things get tight. Like, you know, Give them the alley-oop, you know, throw up the alley and see if they oop that shit. You know, sometimes I do things just to see what my girlfriend does because I know she's going to be funny. You know, I know she's going to, like, say something funny or something like that. You know, because I know she's had a hard day and stuff like that. Stuff like that's becoming a thing I'm saying. I don't like it. Just like, you know what I mean? I got to start looking at that. It's probably driving her crazy, too. If I'm saying it here, I'm probably saying it everywhere. That's not funny. That's not funny at all. But, yeah, another good foundation. Let's see. We got laughter. We got morality. Mm. Let's see. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at trust and um, respect, I I feel like that, sh- that shouldn't be necessarily pointed out as a foundation. That should be bought into it. And I, I don't understand, like, how can you be in a relationship and not respect the other person? That's just... Even though I've seen it, I've seen it happen. Like, I've seen dudes with girlfriends who you can tell the girlfriend thinks no highly of them at all. Like, uh uh no, no, not at all. You know, they think their endeavors are dumb. They think, you know, their ideas are dumb. And they're trying to mold that other person into being what they want. And I've seen that several times. And those relationships usually end in terrible divorces or end up in unhappy marriages that just linger. You know, to me, like, relationships are really about surviving because you have to make it to the end of your life with this person. You know, you you want this person to be there in your last moments, you know. And if they're not, I mean, that's rough. I, I often think I'll probably die first before my girlfriend does. I think I'll definitely die first. With the way I am, yeah. Not like I think I don't need advice or anything like that. I just think my general reaction to like stress and just life, that will probably give me a heart attack around 55. Maybe 48. Yeah. And that's the thing about like I think like for her it's going to be hard, but I think I would take it much harder if she wasn't around. I think that would fuck with me. Deeply, like not having that partner around, not having like, I got to go through the rest of this by myself. That's a horrifying thought. And I think probably for her as well. And I think for anybody who's in a long term relationship, the idea that person can't 
or won't be there anymore. You know, it's so fucking horrifying because, you know, like we talked about last episode, things do end. Everything ends. Life ends. All of it. So in essence, you're just trying to enjoy what you have before it's over. And, you know, it's why like when, you know, when you talk, when people talk about the divorce, they're so bitter about it because at the time they wish they could have seen it to avoid the pain. But to me, it's like, at least you had it. Like people who get married, I always, you know, give them a tip of the cap. Like you did that thing. You made that commitment in public in front of people, whether it's successful or not, it's a whole other different thing. At least you get to the fucking, you know, the wedding chapel. That's pretty fucking dope. At least that's my opinion. I could be wrong. But I think for me, it's just a level of, it's just a level of, I know that I'm not the easiest person to get along with at times. And I know that I can be a bit frustrating is probably a good word annoying definitely but frustrating for sure frustrating I always get messed up that word my girlfriend says I have a list but I've never noticed I had a list my entire life until I started dating her so maybe (sighs) that's deep maybe I'm finally my true self with this person now I'm noticing my list that's fucking weird no one else ever pointed it out my entire life friends Family, no one ever knows that I had to like this weird list with some words, but I kind of do. And it's a little weird. It's a little weird. Then again, I learned how to talk from TV. So maybe I've been spending all my time speaking like somebody I saw on TV. But who I've ever seen on TV that speaks the way I do? I don't know. But to my point, you know, she makes fun of it every now and then. And that's part of the foundation of laughter. I didn't know I had that until she noticed it. And now I notice it and it drives me crazy. But sometimes I'm like, yeah, I have a weird lisp. That's what it is. I have a weird lisp. Weird lisp. Is that ASMR? I have a weird lisp. 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 I couldn't say that three times back to back because, like, I have a weird lisp. I have a weird lisp. (laughs) <laughs> listen by this point most of you aren't even watching anymore so that's fine by me i just do whatever i want but yeah um foundations laughter that's how i live with it you know foundation being laughter just makes and i i, I think don't look at it just as a foundation for your life i find for your relationship look at it for life look at it for work you know like yeah work can be super stressful but you know you got to take souls and you can do what you can do and you got to laugh about it because you don't want to take unnecessary stress into your relationship. It's why you got to learn to laugh. Sometimes, yeah, it's okay to have that thing you've been dealing with and tell it to that person and work through it, but you have to. It's paramount. Learn to laugh. You have to. It's paramount. I just said it's paramount, so you got to do it. You know? That's the thing with Kate. Like, if Kate would just laugh at the blockchain and NFTs, like, dude, like, it, it's not his fault. You don't see the future. And maybe, and maybe, you know, if maybe if she was to get into the NFT culture a little bit, she can start making jokes about it. He can go, yeah, this is kind of ridiculous. And I should have returned to work. Because my, you know, I can't just sit around trading NFTs for Ethereum. I should probably be doing something. So, uh, once again, Kate, still trying to help you. You know, see, see, I don't give up. I don't give up. Maybe, maybe that's a foundation, you know, persistence, you know, desire to keep going, you know, have a goal in mind, be forward thinking, you know, those can't be foundations, those aspects you should have, but persistence is key, I think. Maybe that's a foundation. If you have someone who can be just as persistent as you are, and both working side by side to try to achieve things. Maybe that's a foundation. I don't know, man. Listen, it's Valentine's Day. I'm just asking some fucking questions, man. Like, fuck. You came to me for fucking advice. I'm getting no fucking advice. Shit. I ain't have a name for this fucking guy that sent me this goddamn question. So blame him if you got fucking bullshit. Oh, yeah. 
That's what I got, dude. I'm 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 just a dude, man. I'm 34 years old wearing a Britt Baker shirt. Who the doctor is in, dog. I love Britt Baker. AEW, AEW. <laughs> anyway, fourth question. No name on this one either. I'm I'm starting to think this is coming from my producer. Did we not get a lot of questions? Oh, we did. You just didn't like them. Yeah. All right. All right, Bobby. Okay, Bobby. Hey, Bobby, want me my Valentine this year? You know my girlfriend's really my Valentine. You get my Valentine, Bobby. Bobby Cole, new producer. Give me my Valentine. Don't look at me that way. You have no Valentine. No, you don't. You don't go anywhere. I've never seen you talk to anyone. What woman is taking you out? Well, let me not assume gender. What person is taking you out for Valentine's Day, Bobby? Yeah, no one. Sorry. So when I offer to be your Valentine, you should accept it. Because this is the best you're going to get. Ask my girlfriend. I'm an amazing Valentine. All right. I buy dope ass gifts. All right, I go all out on the gifts, not with the experience. Because, you know, I don't like going places. But I'm good on the gifts. And you're missing out, Bobby. You reject me on Valentine's Day like that again? So help me, God. So help me, God, Bobby. Fourth question. Greatest love story of all time. Go. All right. Hmm. I know what my answer wants to be, but I'm trying to like not make it that answer. Okay, I feel like it's a cliche answer if you're a bit of a film nerd. But I think it's the only answer I have. You know, it's it's Casablanca, bro. Like Casablanca is a hard hitting fucking movie. You know, it takes place in you know World War II French Morocco. You know what I mean? Nazi-occupied France, technically. I mean, if you want to talk about it. You know? But, you know, the Nazis are coming in, and, you know, whoever didn't want to live in a Nazi regime went to this little French, you know, place in Casablanca. And they all, they're all they all hiding out for the most part. So people who are kind of like the leftovers of other countries are all there. And the Nazis are on their way to take over, and Rick, who owns the bar... There called Rick's Americana, an American on the run as well. He has a cool club, made friends with you know the French cops and all that. He's got a little bit of gambling going on, cool dude. But then a flame from his past comes in, and she's got a man named Victor Laszlo with him. And Victor Laszlo is wanted by the Nazis. Dun dun dun. And then again to a situation where Rick kind of is like their last hope of getting out. Getting out of Casablanca before they send Victor Laszlo to the concentration camp. And Rick has to make one of the toughest choices ever. And that's where you get the line, um, we'll always have um we'll always have Paris. You know what I mean? That's where he met his ex flame, not knowing that not knowing that she was actually with him the entire time, but she thought he was dead, and it's it's a lot, but it's worth watching. But the reason why I think it's the greatest love story of all time, because I think in order to love someone, you have to realize you don't own them. You have to realize that they, they're people you're living with. You know, they're people you're experiencing life with. You know, no matter how much you love someone, even, I always even say, like, well, in Rick's defense, or not even Rick's defense, really, in Rick's situation, here's a girl that comes back into his life and he loves her still. You know, it was the heartbreak of all heartbreaks for him. And now she's with this dude and he kind of stands in their way from getting caught by the Nazis or going to America. And he's got to make the choice. Does he let her go with him or does he let him go and he stay and keeps her? And he ultimately makes a choice of not keeping her. He tells her you should go with him. And he even admits to the dude, hey, your wife came to me to try to convince me she was still in love with me. And I let her try. Like, yeah, I got a little bit of stuff in there. But but I need to let her go with you because you two need each other a lot more than I need her. 
He doesn't say that, but he says a variation of a lot of thoughts and moments in that. But it's one of the most heartbreaking love stories, but I think the most true. You know, we often look at the people we've dated as, you know, our moment. We, we own the pain they've given us, and we, they kind of take up this space in our mind, in our spirit of like caricatures or monsters from our past. And, you know, we want to vanquish them. And, you know, you belong to me and you left me and you hurt me. How could you do that? And it's like, well, they're, they're, they're people, you know, and you have to think of people as people. You know, we often get into these interactions and we wonder why is this person so mean? Why is this person so evil? But the truth of the fact is, you know, some of it's us taking in their actions that way. Those people are just flawed people the same, we, same way we are. And we, if we want grace, we have to extend grace. Like, there's several exes of mine that, granted, yeah, I can hold a fucking beef with to the end of time. Because some of the things that happened were just so fucked up. You know, like, I had a girl that was with me. Then she went, you know, do basic training in the military and came back married to somebody else. True story. And we had talked all this, but when she comes back, we're going to get engaged and we're going to do all this. That happened to me. I don't get mad at her about it. She's got a good life now. She's got kids. She's still with that dude. Fuck it, man. Like, she found somebody good. I'm happy. Like, yeah, it fucking sucks that it happened while she was technically with me. But you let those things go because the universe is chaotic and so are people. And you, know, you don't own them. You know, you share in experiences. You share in a relationship. You share in love. You don't necessarily own it. So I think that's something Rick comes to learn in Casablanca. You know, you he doesn't own Ilza Lund. He owns the experience that he can take with him wherever. We'll always have Paris. But he has to let her go because it's not meant for them. And sometimes you have to let go. It's the most painful part of love. It's the one that, it's the one no one prepares you for when you're a kid watching movies. But it is the truth. You have to let it go sometimes. And that doesn't mean new love can't sprout. You know, like it's sad that people say it's sad that I picked that as my greatest love story of all time. But I think it. I think love can mean many things. I think he shows a lot of different kinds of love that he shows his love for her by wanting her to have the best life imaginable but he also shows love to himself because he's healed you know you have to love yourself as well valentine's that's why people used to make a whole big thing about oh you're single on valentine's day dude i love myself so i'm gonna treat myself good on valentine's day you know love is so esoteric and it means so many different fucking things dude like fucking let it be what it's gonna be but yeah, I think that's why it's the greatest love story of all time. And that whole movie is about different kinds of love. It's about like love of country. You know, these people are French who are dealing with Nazi, occup Nazi occupation. And, you know, there's a beautiful scene where the Nazis are in Rick's um, club and they're playing, you know, their um, national anthem. But then Victor Laszlo, who in a moment kind of shows why Elsa Love is in, Elsa Lund is in love with him is that he gets the band Ricks to play um, the French at the La, La Marseille. I, I don't know how to say it, but I'm not going to butcher it. Dun, 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 you know that shit. So he gets them to play, and it's like a dueling anthems, and you're seeing the passion of not only people who love their country, but you're seeing for the first time why she loves that dude, because he's willing to go for what he believes and what he loves, where Rick almost helps him get there. Rick gives the nod to the band, go ahead, play it. But at the same time, even he kind of becomes a believer in that moment. Like, you know, here I've been sulking in this um, club all this time, you know, pining over this lost love and, you know, becoming a very cynical person. But here's this beautiful, beautiful relationship kind of in front of my eyes that, granted, I am <laughs> the side character in, but it's true and it's genuine and it's built on a level of respect and admiration you know, that his and Ilza's weren't built on. They were two people who were broken, who were looking for love, and they find each other at that time, and that's okay. You know, it's some, that's the thing about it. Like, 
there are temporary love stories that are totally fine in life. And you shouldn't get down on them. You shouldn't feel bad about it because they get you to the longer term plot lines, right? But you got to go through those little story arcs the way Dragon Ball Z used to all the fucking time. They'd be like the Garlic Jr. episodes and then bam, you're on to the fucking full on Boo Saga and shit. But that's the beauty of it, you know, and that's the beauty of Casablanca. It shows love on so many levels. You know, and this is another, there's another couple in the movie who's trying to like, you know, you make their way to America. But what happens in Casablanca is the wives have to sleep with some French police to get the signed papers and the husbands never find out. And one girl almost does it, you know, and she tells Rick, she's like, she's like, what could a woman do sometimes? You know, like she's, I, don't, I don't remember the exact words verbatim because that movie, I haven't really watched it in a really long time, but it is my favorite movie of all time. But she kind of asks him, like, if someone loved you and they had to do something they didn't want to do for that love, like, how could you, what would you feel about them? And that's a deep fucking concept. Like, she loves her husband so much, she's going to fuck this French police officer so she can get the signed paper so they can have a better life in America. Probably never going to tell him. Probably never, you know, going to have that shit pop up. That, that's fucking deep. You know, and it's like, that's the level of love I think we live with every day. You know, we don't realize it, but we do these little things. We compromise little things and we sacrifice things for things that we love. And I think that's the beauty part of love. And that's why I've always kind of dug Valentine's Day a bit. You know, I always thought it was kind of cool. It was a day for love. It should be. Love's cool. You know, but yeah, Casablanca, man. Like if you haven't watched it, watch it. It's so good. It's Got some of the best actors of its time. And that script is perfect. Like, it's utterly perfect in its logic. The only logic flaw it has is... One would say that... Alright, so the, the idea is that there's less transit, right? It's not even spoiling anything. This is just what the whole movie's about, really. These letters of transit. And Victor Lazlo has to get them to get out of Casablanca. But they have the signing of this German general... So people would say, well, why would they need the letters of transit? Why would they even be valid if this guy's a wanted man? Like, that just sounds a little weird. But that plot hole aside, it's a fucking fantastic script and a fantastic story. It's one of the best movies ever made. Michael Curtiz probably doesn't get enough credit. I, what I love about him is he always says, I, don't, I didn't shoot movies to look pretty. I shot what I needed for the story. And that's true. Sometimes guys will, girls to everybody who makes movies, will do beautiful shots to hide they don't have a story. I'm sorry. That's just not how it works. Greta Grumberg. Greta Gerwig. Every time. Every time. Anyway. Casablanca. Watch it. And that, my friends, is our Valentine's Day episode. I had a lot of... Actually, I had a lot of fun. Actually, that was kind of cool. It's kind of real mellow. I dug it. Didn't expect that. We're in a lot of places with it. But I want to thank Kate, who, good luck with the NFTs on that blockchain, which you should be investing in. Just saying. Good luck to Balthazar and the cult wife. Uh, Thanks to the other two jerks who sent in questions about names. Thanks a lot for that. We'd love to have thanked you publicly, but you're jerks. Bobby, happy Valentine's Day. Don't even speak. Don't even say a word. I don't even want you to say a word. Shut the fuck up. Say nothing. You rejected me as your Valentine. You're a piece of shit. All right? I must, man, wait till your fucking birthday comes up. See what I do then, dog. See what I do then for your birthday, Bobby. My birthday's coming up. I won't be celebrating it. Don't wish me a happy birthday. You can wish me a happy birthday. I'm fucking around. Or am I? No, I'm kidding. You wish me a happy birthday if you want. Um, February 22nd. It's going down. 34. 34 won't have an episode for like we have 33 but um it's coming but have a great valentine's day i don't know what we'll be talking about on the next episode i'm being honest with you. i don't know i i would love to say next week but i don't even fucking know um but yeah um happy valentine's day but then again i think you and i both know how this is going to end